Sun Manani. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning. If that's Wayne singing when he's sick, then he's better than me on his sick day, then I am on my best day. So thank you, Wayne, for serving us even though you were sick and not feeling well. As we come to God's word this morning, let's pray and ask him for help. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning to look at your word, to see what it says about reality, about life, about our condition, and about your grace that is available to us. Father, as we think about something so intimate to all of us, something we all know and understand and experience on a daily basis, as we come to examine this in light of your word, we pray that you help us. Father, help us by the power of your spirit to recognize how our hearts are so able to pursue things that are not worthy of you. We are so able to desire things that are even good to such a degree that we are willing to sin against you. We are so able to be enticed by our own desires and the temptations of the evil one. And Father, as we consider this, this reality, we pray that you would help us to see the hope that you give us in these moments of temptation. That we would be able to embrace the way that you provide for us to respond to temptation. But Lord, ultimately we, we know we cannot respond in this way unless you have done a work in our lives. And so we want to thank you this morning for the great work of salvation that you accomplished on our behalf through your Son. Father, we deserve death and eternal condemnation, but in your grace you sent your Son to show us your love, to pay the penalty for our sin, so that we can be forgiven and have hope of eternal life with you. So that even though we face temptation and sometimes we fail, and we know that we will fail, we know that you have paid the price for our sin and we have true hope that one day we will be able to stand before you Father not because of what we have done but because of what Christ has done for us and that is the hope that gives us joy and enables us to face these temptations with great hope to overcome them and we pray that you'll instill this hope in our hearts as we go through your word this morning in Jesus name Amen. Every one of you, before the sun sets today, every single one of you are going to be tempted to sin. You will be tempted. It's guaranteed. There is no way the sun's going to set this evening without you facing some form of temptation. And this morning we're going to look at how temptation works so that we can watch our hearts and resist the devil and we're going to do that by continuing our series in Genesis and I just want to do a brief recap of where we are in the book before we get into our passage in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 all the way to chapter 2 verse 3 we see the account of God creating the universe and then in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 through to chapter 2 verse 25, we see the account zooming in on mankind. And there we see God's creation of man, God's command to man, and God's completion of man by providing him with a suitable helper. And this morning we're going to see how all this good was lost, what Milton calls paradise lost. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, and we're going to see something of the pathology of temptation, how it works in the human heart. And so I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 will start 
reading by way of context from chapter 2 verse 25, the last verse of chapter 2, and then we'll read from 3 verse 1 to 3 verse 7. So, you can turn your Bible to Genesis, right in the beginning of your Bible, and let's look at chapter 2 verse 25 and read that together. Chapter 2 verse 25 says, Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Chapter 3 verse 1, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die. The serpent said to the woman, In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And so reads the words of the living God. I want you to notice here that in chapter 2 verse 25 and chapter 3 verse 7, we have this repeated word, this nakedness. They were naked and felt no shame in verse 25. And then they realized they were naked in chapter 3, verse 7. And this passage, one commentator puts it this way, is the explanation of how Adam and Eve moved from innocent nakedness to shameful nakedness, or from integrity to guilt. The events that are happening here not only affect mankind's relationship with each other, but mankind's relationship with God and God's relationship with the entire universe. This is a very, very important passage of Scripture. And Martin Lloyd-Jones put it this way. He said, There is no doubt at all that judged from almost any angle you like, Genesis 3 is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. Close quote. Now before we, we dig into the details of the passage, I want us just to consider the passage as a whole. If we look at, let's look at the themes of what's going on here. This account explains why sin is universal today. It explains why. Why is the world the way it is today? Why did you have to lock your house before you came here? Why are you all hoping you locked your car when you parked it here? Why are you... Um, reading so much bad news every day? Why do you get sick? Why have you had someone close to you die? Why will you die if Jesus doesn't return before? This account explains why. But it also explains how. How did that happen? How did the human race fall into sin? It gives the details of the fall. It explains how how Adam and Eve fell because that is the same way people fall into sin even today. It's the same way. It follows the same pattern. Right now, all over the world, there are people, perhaps even Christians, being tempted to sin. Right now as I speak. And the way they are being tempted to sin will follow this pattern as you see it unfolds in the passage. In fact, right now, in this room, someone must be tempted to sin in some way, to be distracted from what God is saying, to think a simple thought, to uh, judgmentally criticize something or someone that didn't work out according to your expectations. We are all tempted. And the way that temptation works follows this pattern. The pattern of your temptation will align with what we see happening in our passage. There's something pretty amazing about this account of temptation that you must get and I don't want you to miss this this account shows us that people can disobey God 
even in the most ideal conditions, in the most ideal, perfect conditions, people can still disobey God. That's what happens here. Think about Adam and Eve. Their disobedience certainly cannot be blamed on their environment, can it? The environment was perfect. Absolutely perfect. That garden was paradise itself. Adam and Eve's disobedience also cannot be blamed on their parents because their parents was God Himself. God Himself created them. And everything they needed to know about life and how to live life was, it was given by instruction of God Himself. And this should get you thinking. This should really get you thinking. Adam and Eve could not could sin in the most perfect environment and without any family problems. They could still disobey God. Now wait a minute, think about that. Think about that. Do you believe people can do bad things only because of their surrounding and family problems? That's what we get taught everywhere. At school I was taught that. At university I was taught that. At work I was told that. If you can just change someone's environment, and maybe um, change their family life, maybe move them to a different family, they will really behave a whole lot better. And they will not do the bad things they do. While family life and environment have some impact on our behavior, they are not determinative. Because this is what this passage teaches. It teaches us that even in the most ideal conditions, you cannot blame ultimately your environment, and you cannot blame ultimately your family for the decisions that you make. This is a lie that all your, this bad thing to do are a result of outside influence. This is a lie that is deep in our culture. Very, very deep. And we all believe this lie at some level. Right now, right here, there are young people here sitting who believe that the sins that they did and they do and the choices they make are really their parents' fault. If my parents had not done this, then I would not be tempted to do this. If my parents had not done this, then I would not be forced to respond in this way. That's how young people think. I know that because I was a young person myself. But the reality is, the reality is that ultimately it's not your environment, it's not your family problems that force you to sin. James 1 verse 14 says, But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. As Steve and I were discussing this in the office, I described it like this, and then Steve corrected me. I said, you know, sometimes I think temptation is like a hook, and it hooks something sinful in you and it hooks you. And that's why people are hooked by maybe a con man, because he hooks the greed in you. He hooks that idea that I can make a lot of money by doing no work. And he hooks that in you, and before you know it, you've given him all your money, and there he's taking it and run away. There's something in you that he hooks. Otherwise, the thing wouldn't tempt you. And Steve said, no, John, it's actually the other way around. Your heart is like, you can imagine your heart, you've just got coming out of you like some kind of a, a Velcro organism with hooks on it. It's looking for things to hook. Your heart is actually looking and throwing out hooks to catch something that it can desire. Desire more than it desires God. Our hearts are actively involved in seeking things that will draw us and entice us away from God. And that's what James 1 verse 14 is saying. It's saying your desires, your evil desires are enticing you and drawing you away. And the picture there is of entices of a hook hooking something and drawn away is of a drag net catching fish and taking them out. It's a fishing kind of idea. And so what's doing the enticing? The outside influence or our evil desires? Our evil desires. Our evil desires. Our desires hook us and drag us into temptation. Our desires are not alone though. The devil is there. And he is helping and facilitating the whole process. And that's what we'll see in our passage. We'll see in our narrative four stages of temptation so we can resist the devil 
and guard our hearts. Four stages of temptation. And so we'll work through that systematically. And the first stage, how temptation always starts, is temptation doubts God's word. That's our first point. Temptation doubts God's word. Let's look at verses 1 to 3 there. Temptation doubts God's word. Verse chapter Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And so when you read that, you're like, where does the serpent come from? That's a mystery. The text isn't interested in that. Where does the serpent come from? Does he have legs? Does he not have legs? Is he beautiful? Is he not beautiful? What does it look like? The fact is, it's a serpent. The account is not interested in all the details. What you must know about the serpent is that it was cunning, or crafty, or deceptive. And the very fact that it was a serpent and not the devil himself with horns and hooves and all his terror shows us how temptation always comes in disguise. It comes as an animal. So Adam and Eve would not be threatened by this animal straight away, would they? It's just an animal. They have authority over animals. They have dominion over animals. It comes unassumingly. It, and it craftily approaches the woman and not the man. And the most important thing about the serpent, according to the text here, is what the serpent says. It's what the serpent says. Before this moment, God spoke, and His creation and His commands were very clear. Now what God said will become a matter of debate as the serpent starts speaking. Because this is where the devil always starts with temptation. He starts with casting doubt on what God has said. That's where it always starts. Now from the rest of the Bible we know that the, the devil is animating the serpent. Revelation 12 verse 9b says the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. And that's what's happening here. The serpent's coming to deceive Eve. Now the disguise and the unassuming nature of the serpent's speech takes Eve by surprise. Before she knows it, she is talking with the snake. I mean, it's a strange thing to do. And, none, and not only is she talking with the snake, but she's talking with the enemy of her soul. It comes, the serpent came so unassumingly, so subtle. And that's how temptation comes in your life. It comes like this, subtle. It comes through an idle conversation. It comes through a nice conversation with your friend. It comes through looking at online content comes through watching something on Netflix or YouTube or, or TV or whatever you do watch. It comes in allowing a thought to roam through your mind unhindered and not taking every thought captive to obey Christ. Temptation comes very suddenly. You should not expect temptation to come and scare you. It comes suddenly. You don't expect it to come there. And then let's look at the serpent's question. Temptation comes suddenly. And then temptation asks you these kind of questions. The serpent asked the woman, Did God really say? Did God really say? And this is the start of the trouble. Are you sure that's what God said? Are you certain that's what He meant? One writer put it like this, Eve had a perfectly clear commandment from God, but the serpent planted seeds of doubt in her mind. He does the same in our minds. Maybe that verse doesn't really mean what it looks as if it means. Maybe God doesn't mean for us to take that literally. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Close quote. Back to verse 1. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? This question is designed to raise doubts, to twist what God said. And notice how he overemphasizes the prohibition God gives. God says you can't eat from one tree. He says any tree. And it, it overstates the prohibition and it ignores the bounty of what God has given. That's often how temptation works. The serpent is making God out to be a spoil sport, isn't it? He's saying, did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? What kind of a spoil sport is God? He's robbing you of all this joy and bounty in life. And so Eve has to defend God and herself, and so she gives an answer. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit from the trees of the, in the garden. 
but from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Now this answer is mostly right, but notice how it differs. It differs in three ways from God's command. First, our answer minimizes, Eve's answer minimizes God's bountiful provision. God said in Genesis 2.16, you may eat freely to your heart's content, in other words. Eve says, you only have permission to eat. Yeah, verse 2. Second, the answer adds to God's ban. God said, uh, God only banned the eating, yet Eve also bans the touching. And so in an attempt to create distance between her and the temptation, she adds, she adds rules that God hasn't given. She adds to God's words to try and protect herself from the danger of this temptation, but that doesn't work. Did it help Eve? It did not. Adding to God's commands doesn't actually help you stand against temptation. And that idea is still alive today in many places. There are some churches who add to God's word and say, well, believers shouldn't eat pork. Or you can only use this translation of the Bible or else you are in serious error and a heretic. That, that, that thinking is still alive today, but that never works, friends. To add to God's word, to try and stop yourself sinning, does not work because Colossians 2 verse 20 says that those kind of things are of no value in curbing self-indulgence. They are of no value. Adding to God's word does not help you stand in temptation and it's proven in this case it didn't help Eve at all. And third, Eve's answer minimizes the consequence of sin. God said you will surely die and Eve says you will die. It's, it's kind of weakening the certainty of the fact that when you sin there are going to be consequences for sure you can bet your life on it there will be consequences when you sin but our thinking today Eve's thinking here and thinking even today is people people minimize the idea that there are consequences to sin there are many people who even claim to be Christian who simply do not believe that God will judge any sin they really do not believe that God will judge any sin and so when we zoom out of this interchange, we just want to notice a few things about God's words. This, this, these few verses are, are talking a lot about what God said, what the serpent said, and what Eve said. God's words are quoted three times in this passage, and every time they are quoted wrongly. First, the serpent misquotes God's words and questions them. Second, Eve paraphrases God's words with major changes. And then third, in the next verse, you see the serpent flatly denies God's word. He says, no, in verse, uh, as he continues there, in verse 4, no, you will not die. This is how temptation works. It always does violence to the word of God, we can say. And the only way to, res to respond to this is to know God's word, to respond rightly to temptation. And that's what we see in Jesus' example in the wilderness. When Jesus is tempted, he quotes God's word correctly, rightly. And that's how he stands. And this should point us to one reality. That knowing God's word is vital to resisting temptation. Knowing God's word is vital to resisting temptation. Without knowing the Word of God, friends, we can fall a long way, a long, long way. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. That's what the psalm says there. And friends, that is why at this church we labor to teach you God's Word. That is why we do it. Because it is vital to resist temptation. We know you will be tempted today. I know I will be tempted today. What do I need to resist temptation? What do I need so that I may not sin against God? I need God's word hidden in my heart. I want you to understand something, friends, that Bible study is not a hobby for holy people. It, it is not a sideline for the saints. It is not a diversion for the devoted. It is a lifeline. A lifeline for God's people. You don't know God's word, you're vulnerable vulnerable to the devil's schemes, you're vulnerable to temptation, you're vulnerable to your own heart, seeking desires and desiring things that are not of God. 
The only way you can stand in that moment of temptation is if you know the Word of God. So temptation doubts God's Word. Second, temptation distrusts God's goodness. It distrusts God's goodness. Look at verse 4. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. This is a bold, direct denial of what God said in Genesis 2 verse 17. And the way the serpent puts this is very interesting. The, the Hebrew is very interesting here. First, the no comes first. And that's very clear in my translation. Some of your translations will say, you will surely not die. But the no is right there. It's right there in the front. That's emphasizing that the devil is flatly contradicting what God has said. He says no. And then when he quotes what God said, you will not surely die, he actually quotes it more correctly than Eve does. The devil knows God's word better than Eve does in this situation. He knows God's word better, he quotes it more closely, and he denies it flatly. And that's what's, what temptation does. It denies the consequences of disobedience. It says there will be no consequences. No need to worry about that. I know exactly what God said. I can quote it perfectly. I'm telling you, it's not going to work out like that. You will, you will make it. You'll be okay. Don't worry about what God said then. One commentator sums up the danger of this line excellently. He says, here is the line that has allured the human race from the beginning. There is no punishment for disobedience. That's the lie. There is no punishment for disobedience. He continues, but the Bible again and again makes it clear that no one can get away with sin. Disobedience brings death. And the Bible is full of scriptures that say disobedience brings death. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23 to quote one of many. Verse 5 continues that the serpent says there, in fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And here is what makes Adam and Eve sin such a big deal. Not only was it disobeying God's clear command, it was the reason. The reason they disobey God and the reason the serpent gives them to disobey God is that basically God is not good. God is withholding something very good from you, Adam and Eve. He doesn't want you to have that. He is jealous. He's not good. He wants to keep your eyes closed. He wants you to, to limit you. He wants to keep you down. He does not want your eyes truly open. And this is what make, made eating the food such an evil thing. It was doubting the very goodness of God. It was assuming the worst of God. As if God is some kind of massive cosmic killjoy. And He wants your life to be miserable. And so He's withholding these very good things from you. And you can only get them by sinning against God. By rebelling against God. I want you just to think about how God had provided for Adam and Eve so far. He provided food they didn't need to labor for so they could, so they could be physically sustained. God provided work in the garden for Adam to do so he could exercise his creative ability, his physical strength find a sense of fulfillment in his daily work. God provided vast varieties of animals and plants that Adam could explore and study for the use and benefit of his family. God provided a perfect help for Adam and Eve. God also gave Adam a commandment so Adam could learn to be responsible and obey God. And God himself said that all that he had given Adam was good. Very good. God had given Adam all of this. And yet the serpent comes along and he says, you know, all of that doesn't matter. Because the only thing that really matters is that God is holding this one good thing from you. If you have this one good thing, then your life will be complete. In fact, you will be like God. So Adam and Eve are faced with a, a choice here. Who are you going to believe? Whose perspective are you going to believe? Are you going to listen to what God has said and and believe what he says to be true? Or are you going to believe this new perspective you've just received from the serpent? The devil knows how powerful an idea is. And that's why he fills our world with ideas that are contrary to God. There are ideas everywhere contrary to God. He fills the world with ideas. And all he needed to do was to get start, Eve start thinking, to start thinking about the possibility of disobeying God not having any consequence. 
you started with that, no, you will not down. And then you sow the idea, the seed of the idea, that you can have your eyes open and be like God. First, there will be no consequences. Second, you will be like God. So it takes away the thing that should be there to guard us from sin, and then he introduces something that allures us to sin. That's how temptation works. And that's how temptation works today. Today, when you are going to be enjoying lunch, Mother's Day lunch, there will be a temptation to say, there won't be any consequences if you have that extra piece of cake. There won't be any consequences if you drink that extra glass or extra sugary soda or whatever it is. Or take or waste that extra time. Are you not free to do what you want? Are you going to let some verse or some silly sermon control your life? Are you really going to do that? No, be free. Do what you want, when you want, how you want. Do it like that. Well, if we follow that pattern, we will end up in bondage. And we will do what our habit wants, when it wants, and how it wants. See, the promise of freedom there is actually a way to lead you into greater and greater bondage. So temptation distrusts God's goodness. Temptation then draws our senses. Look at verse 6 there. The serpent has now removed the barriers to eating in two ways. He has claimed there will be no consequence and he said that they will be like God when they eat it. And now the work of the tempter is finished and the serpent disappears from the narrative. And he leaves Eve to the sensual appeal of the fruit itself. Look at chapter, I mean verse 6, chapter 3, verse 6. It starts saying, Then the woman saw that the tree, of the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. Those three, that threefold description matches John's description of worldly temptation, doesn't it? 1 John 2 verse 16. For everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of one in one's lifestyle is not from the Father, but is from the world. So it starts here, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. That is the lust of the flesh. This fruit looked like it would not kill them, but in fact, be sweet and satisfying. This is kind of like the attraction of an ice-cold Coke to a diabetic. It's kind of like the call of wine to the alcoholic. It is the summons of the supersized burger to the obese. This may be good for food, but will it be good for you? That's the question, isn't it? Will it be good for you? That, that food, that Fruit may have been edible, but was it good for Eve and Adam to eat from it? So that's the lust of the flesh. And then it was delightful to look at, and that is the lust of the eyes. This fruit had an aesthetic beauty unlike any other. And the fact that it was forbidden probably added to its luster and beauty and glow in their eyes. You know what this is like. You know what it's like when you tell your children, don't touch that thing, and then it becomes the most wonderful thing in the world. You... You buy them countless toys, and here they go, and they see one of your tools, which is very sharp, and they say, that's the one I want. And the fact that I'm not allowed to have it makes it even more desirable. I need it in my life. And that is how temptation works. It's the lust of the eyes. But as adults, we know what this is like as well. We know what the lust of the eyes is like. Why do you think in shop fronts they put lights on all the wonderful things they can sell you? A beautiful pair of shoes in the shop front with the lights just right so that it looks amazing. And you can say, wow. So this is what the lust of the eyes does. It's like that pair of shoes in the store lights to the debt-laden and impulsive shopper. It's like that collectible, collectible trinket for the hobbyist who just like to collect certain things. And he has way too many of that thing, but he's allured by the next thing because this is better in some way. It's like the latest and greatest gadget that promises to solve all your life problems, make you even better and more organized. A gadget can't make you more organized as a basic function of life. It can help if you're organized already. But this is, the, this is how temptation works. This is the lust of the eyes. And then she saw that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. That is the pride in one's lifestyle. 
This fruit held potential for her. And she thought, just imagine what it would be like to eat this fruit and be so wise, almost be as wise, maybe even as wise as God himself. This knowledge promises to take me beyond my plane of thinking. I'll have deep insight into the things of life. I will have understanding that could be compared to God's understanding. Friend, isn't that the promise of all the worldly academic pursuits in life, isn't it? You'll be so wise. You'll have this insight. You will surpass all your peers in all wisdom and insight, and you will have the insight track, and you'll be able to use that to your advantage. That's the pride in one's lifestyle kind of like the pursuit of a scholar who wants worldly wisdom and wants to be known and famed for his worldly wisdom, but at the end of the journey, he finds himself doubting the most basic, self-evident truths and wondering if he even can know anything because he's been taught so much strange philosophy, he can't make sense of anything. But as Eve looks at this and she sees all these attractions to the fruit, she forgets something very, very basic. Very, very obvious that to disobey God is evil. To disobey God is evil. And that's what I forget in the throes of temptation, and that's what you forget in the throes of temptation. Friend, disobeying God is an evil thing. It is an evil thing, and that evil deed will always bring consequences. That's how God has set up the world. To disobey God is evil, And evil deeds will bring consequences. That basic truth she forgets. And so, at the end of verse 6, it says, So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Look at all the verbs here. Once her mind was convinced. Once she had forgotten that disobeying God was evil. Once her senses were overwhelmed with the temptation. The action happened straight away. She took, ate, gave, he ate. This is telling us something, that once you have given in to temptation, there is no hesitation, there is no stopping off way, you are committed. Eve leads the way and moves from being tempted to being the tempter of her husband, and he willfully disobeys God's command without any further convincing needed. He just follows her, and their fall is sudden, it is total, and between Satan's temptation and their worldly lust, they are completely overwhelmed. And defeated by what happens here. And so as temptation draws on their senses, we'll see finally what it delivers. It delivers hostility. It delivers temptation, delivers hostility. This is our final point. The seven, then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made, them, made loincloths for themselves. Notice the anticlimax here. Don't miss the anticlimax of the story. It's, it's showing them how this thing attracted them slowly and all the details and all of that. But now notice once they've, they've partaken of the sin, notice what happens. They were expecting this fruit to give them strength. They're expecting this fruit to give them pleasure. They're expecting this fruit to give them wisdom. That's what the previous verse says. They're expecting their eyes to be open to a new world of greater strength pleasure, and wisdom. And well, their eyes were opened all right, but what their eyes were open to was evil. Was evil. They knew more now than before, but what they now knew was evil. They now had the memory of doing evil themselves. And they were exposed and guilty before God and before each other. One commentator puts it this way, what was right before was now very wrong. They knew more, but that additional knowledge was evil. They saw more, but what they now saw, they spoiled by seeing. The very act of seeing now, after they have disobeyed God, is now making things spoiled, making things evil. Everything was now dirty and shameful. Their relationship with God is damaged. Their relationship with each other is damaged. Their trust, their security, their intimacy with each other is replaced by mistrust, insecurity, alienation. Why do you think they have to cover themselves? 
Because now they're looking at each other and they realize we are both sinners. We are selfish people. We do what we want to do. We do not do what God wants to do. Now I cannot trust you anymore because you are a sinner like me. You have desires and you're willing to sin to get those desires, and so do I. We need to cover ourselves, and that's what the covering is about. It's about not being able to enjoy safety in their relationship anymore because they both realize that we are now sinners and selfish people, and we can use each other and abuse each other and not do right by each other because we have both sinned against God. And the, the even greater reality is in this moment, a great separation occurs between man's body and his soul. Before this moment, man's body was not subject to decay and death, and was united to his soul in a way that they could live forever in the presence of God. But at this moment, a great tear happens. And now all of us, from that day forward, we have a soul that will not die, but we have a body that will die. A body that will die, and a body that will actually cause more temptation for us to sin against God. That is a massive change in the God and a massive change in the history of the world. Man's body and soul are no longer fully united. Our bodies will decay and die. Our souls will live forever. And that is what happened in the garden. What do we learn from this? How can we fight temptation after seeing this tragic story? First, we learn that we are warned by this passage not to doubt God's word. Don't doubt God's word but know it and believe it. Second, we are warned not to distrust God's goodness, but to fully trust that God is good. Third, we are warned not to indulge the lusts of the world, but instead to obey God. Fourth and finally, we are warned that temptation always brings trouble. So we must never believe the promises that temptation makes. Temptation makes grand promises, but it delivers trouble delivers trouble for you and for those around you. So know and believe God's word, trust in God's goodness, obey God's commands, don't believe temptation's lives. This is how you can be armed to face the temptation that will come your way today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness to us in showing us that you understand exactly what we face when we are tempted. And you have shown us the way to resist temptation. Help us to look at this tragic, tragic story of Adam and Eve and to recognize that we are no better than Adam and Eve and we need to guard against our own hearts and also the temptations of the devil. Lord, we pray that you would help us to trust your word, to believe that you are good, to obey your commands and to not believe temptation's lies. We ask that we would do this by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.